I think in a workplace where you have a dominant culture, it sends signals to other people that if that's what it, if that's what success looks like, if that's what the leadership group looks like, then it's harder for the broader organisation to identify with that leadership group unless they all look like that. I was talking recently with a former colleague of mine, just sort of some insights as to you know, why she had or hadn't um, got various roles over the years. This was an extremely talented individual, but she wasn't, as I put it, straight from central casting. And I think many people in leadership roles, when they're looking for a new person to run an area, they have a mental image of what the person will look like. It happens a lot, and I, and I am conscious that, you know, I, I do it myself from time to time, which is, you know, you go to fill a role and you go, oh, I want something just like Fred used to do it over at this other place or something like that. Well, that's the way you perpetuate biases. I worked in the financial markets in the 1980s, so it's almost axiomatic that you've seen um, behaviours and um, activities that are disrespectful to women in the workplace. The norm of guys going out, having drinks at a pub, um, telling stories, you know, it just they're all things that I can easily understand that don't work for women, that, that dealing room environment. And there have been a number of events and occasions when I guess I've just been presented with the reality of, you know, gee, I was sort of a part of a culture that really doesn't work. It's one thing to feel uncomfortable. The question then is, where, where do you get the confidence to be able to speak up or, or reshape it? And there were times when I felt uncomfortable but didn't feel I could do anything about it. There were times when I would see something and actually go, you know, I can do something about it, I can reshape this. And I think that's really sort of, in many ways, as I was maturing in leadership and management roles, was this realisation that actually, as a leader, I can help shape the, the norms and I can help shape the, um, the behaviours in a workplace because, you know, there's an expression that you get what you put up with and therefore if you don't want something, then you don't put up with it. I don't know why the respect value is the one that niggles at me the most, but it, it does and I don't know whether it was something when I was growing up or, um, you know, maybe the sort of the schooling I had or, or the parental values I grew up with, but it's just something that's always sat with me, which is, I, you know, I worry when other people might take offence from something I've done, it, it, it hurts me, uh, and so I've tried to be sensitive to it, you know, in what ways am I perpetuating problems in a workplace? And respect is about understanding and being sensitive to the fact that everyone in your organisation and all your customers are individuals with their own individual needs and therefore having a monocultural approach to it isn't going to work for the customer base and isn't going to work for the people that work for you. When I did uh, my sort of first year finance and accounting at university and economics uh, and I looked around the room, I think in the accounting class of two or three hundred there might have been half a dozen women. You know, I grew up in New Zealand so most of the guys were playing rugby and then you'd have beer and then you would do your accounting and finance studies and some economics and that was your norm. And today, when new graduates are coming out of universities, they've been pretty much in 50-50 gender mix throughout their classes. Being on a very even footing with women in a working environment is second nature. There's nothing special about it. And yet, the workforces that many of people of my generation started in didn't look like that. The change, I guess, is very much required from the men who want to continue to be relevant.